Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. This is Halloween, our picks for a Halloween game night. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me, live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch. Tis the season of ghosts and ghouls, and due to our recording schedule, if we wait until next week, which is a little closer to Halloween, our show would come out the day after. So we decided to spend tonight talking about the games we would pick for a Halloween game night. After that, I've got a detailed review of one of those games, The Ghost Betwix, and a fairly quick look at a solo RPG adventure game that fits in your pocket that's live on Kickstarter right now. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a comment from David Hutchinson. I hope you heal quickly from your surgery. I was finally able to listen to your Twitch live stream. Watching streams would be bad at my workplace. <laughs> Very interesting discussion about different game styles. Insect games would be cool. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, healing still happening. Uh, things didn't quite go as smoothly as planned, which is why we did have to miss an extra week. But I'm here now, and we're back gaming on the regular. Next up, Roy Valstar commented on our Bastille review to say, Thanks for your review and rules and gameplay overview. You're welcome, Roy. Um, also great to see some of our older content still getting some love. Bastille is one of those games that I like to now mention whenever people are like, What's a hidden gem game? What's a game no one's talking about? And it always makes me happy when people discover that older stuff. Well, next up, Game Enthus commented on our Chiseled review. I've had this game since PAX U last year, <laughs> and it's been staring at me on my shelf. I'll be reviewing it soon. I appreciate this video. Must have some head cards on top of the deck. I'm <laughs> glad you enjoyed the video, uh, Game Enthus. Uh, Chiseled was not a hard one to actually get playing after reading the rules. Uh, so don't be intimidating by it. It's it's definitely not that complicated. It's not as complicated as you might think. I, I would say get that game to the table sooner rather than later. It's totally worth it. And then finally, a comment on our Aldibus Doors of Cartagena, Cartagena review from Mr. Grand Gamers Guild himself, Mark Spector. Good morning. I'm back from Essen and listening to your Aldibus review. Thanks for spending so much time with Aldibus. As games go, it really does take multiple plays to shine and I'm so grateful you broke through to see that. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. Though I got to say my phone going off at 3.47 a.m. last night was a little annoying, but I then put it on vibrate, so we were good. You can definitely tell he was coming back from Essen. Um, thanks for sending the game our way to check out, actually. Um, as you mentioned, yeah, it took a bit, but the game is a big hit around here. And I'll admit it, with the review's done, but we're still playing it. So that's always a really good sign. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback by commenting on our posts, emailing mo at tabletopbellhop.com, or sending us a message on or, say, or tagging us on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is based on the fact that Halloween is right around the corner. And due to our release schedule, if we didn't talk about it tonight, we'd miss that. The question is, what games would we pick for a Halloween game night in 2022? So now we've talked about horror-themed board game nights in the past, and we recommended some spooky games before, but both of those episodes were well over a year old at this point. Plus, they were focused on, like, the best horror games or the best creepy games to play. Best of the genre overall, and not what we'd personally choose to be playing, say, right now. So games like movies, of course, are very personal. We won't mm -hmm. all agree on best or favorite Halloween movies. And likewise, we won't all see eye to eye here either. And just to be clear, tonight's list are the games that are we're most interested in playing at a Halloween game night. It's not meant to be a list of the best Halloween games or the best horror games or anything like that. It's just what we feel most like playing at the time we sat down and worked on this list in the last week. Similar to when we talked about superhero RPGs that I was currently reading, we aren't even trying to make a comprehensive list here. No. 
Now that said, I'm sure people are going to be wondering why we didn't mention specific games or be bummed that their favorite game didn't make the list. That's fair. But what those people should do is comment and let us know about those games. That way we can call them out on a future episode's feedback segment and everyone's favorite Halloween games can get a shout out. Comment on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you saw this episode shared, or send an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. All right, hopefully that'll help with some of the internet outrage we get every time we share a game list. On to the games. Now, with this being a Halloween list, we decided to narrow things down to 13 games exactly. We've got three RPGs we wanted to highlight, followed by 10 board games. Except for that distinction, this list is in no particular order. Okay, so one of the things we did do when picking games for this list is consider the fact that your Halloween game night may involve kids. Because of this, we made sure to include a handful of games that are great for friends and family game night, as well as games better suited to playing once the kids are in bed or while they're out collecting treats. Now let's start off with three RPGs we would love to run or play during a Halloween game night. All right, when talking RPGs in Halloween, what I want to personally do, and I actually want to do this, like if we were planning a Halloween game night, this would be near the top of the list, is I want to run a one-shot game something just for Halloween using pre-generated characters so we can get right to the action. That said, in the past, when running a campaign in any system, I've done Halloween themes adventures as well, sticking with the regular group and the storyline. Both are great Halloween options. Now, the Halloween game I'm most interested in running would be a session of Tales from the Loop, the game that's set in the 80s that never would. I, I, I would love to do a Halloween themed horror game kids on bikes adventure that's actually set on Halloween. Like I want the kids to be going to school on Halloween. I want kids in costumes. I want all that Halloween stuff going on with, of course, something wonky happening, most likely because of the loop, because that's what you do in the Tales from the Loop. And it, of course, will be some type of mystery to solve. Now, what I would love to do is go pick up a published adventure and do this, but I didn't see one. There doesn't seem to be a Halloween Tales from the Loop adventure. Um, maybe there are some out there people have made, and if there have, please let me know. I'd love to throw a link to it in the show notes. But what I would probably do is take an existing adventure that's already in there, change the date to be Halloween, and then just ha add in Halloween elements to what's already there. Like, I can totally see playing through some kind of stupid Halloween thing at school that some of the kids are all excited about and want to take part in. And then some of the other kids are like in the corner grumping and not wanting to take part. And I can totally see just like throwing things like a crowd of kids trick or treating out in the street as a complication could be fantastic. So that was Tales from the Loop with a homebrew Halloween adventure. Next up, we have Alien. The next choice would be the Alien RPG running just the cinematic adventure in the starter set. There's nothing you really need to do to Alien to make it Halloween appropriate. It's already a horror game. Cinematic adventures are already set up with pre-gens tied to the stories, though I do worry that the starter set adventure may be better played over more than one night. Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to actually get this one to the table, so it's also an excuse to get to play Alien for the first time for both of us. And that was the Alien RPG from Free League Publishing, actually, who's also the publisher of uh, Tales from the Loop that we just mentioned. Our third choice would be a game of Dungeon Crawl Classics, the OSR role-playing game of somewhat ridiculousness. Now, there are a number of horror adventures created for this one already. It's actually got its own category at the Goodman Games website. Now, personally, I would specifically run Creek Scrag Creep as it's a zero level adventure. So perfect for doing a funnel. The story here is the characters wake up on a haunted ship with no memory of how they got there. You've got all your little peasants all gathered together, your gong farmers and merchants and 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 bunch of peons, because that's what you play through your first adventure, having to deal with a ship filled with undead and bodies and all kinds of awesome Halloween stuff. Now, what's cool about the horror adventures from DCC is that if you do have an ongoing game, they have a number of different choices you can pick from going all the way up to level six. So as long as your group isn't too high a level, you can easily just toss one of these in and interject it into your existing campaign. 
And that was a horror funnel for Dungeon Crawl Classics. Now, moving on to board games that we think would be great for a Halloween game night. All right, let's start with the one that's great for the whole family, which you can play before the kids go out. And that's Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, though, particularly with the Creepy Cellar expansion. If I was running it, I would not keep that expansion. Now, we've mentioned this one a lot, but for good reason. And I expect any future horror Halloween themed episode list will continue to have this as well as pretty much every best kids games list because we're still not sick of this one. Now, this is a cooperative game for up to four players where you're trying to sneak into a haunted house, steal a set of gems before ghosts take over the place. Just difficult enough to be challenging and it encourages teamwork. Now, the expansion just makes things a little bit easier. The base game's a little difficult, and it does give you some randomness mitigation, as well as a whole cool new board and some other neat stuff going on. The game is definitely better with the expansion. And that was Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters with its expansion. Now, on the less kid-friendly scale, we have the Ghosts Betwixt, which mm. is better suited to teens and adults. This is a modern dungeon crawler where you have a family searching a haunted theme park for their kidnapped child. You could start a new campaign and play scenario one on Halloween, or if you're past mission four, you could play a scavenger hunt. If you have them unlocked, scavenger hunts are a good way to play with new people without really impacting your main campaign. Learn more about the Ghost Betwixt in our review segment later in the show. And that was the Ghost Betwixt. Next, I have Mansions of Madness, specifically the second edition. If you still happen to have the first edition, sell that, use the money, buy second edition. Because the big thing the second edition adds is an app. And this app is fantastic. You've got an app-driven Lovecraftian horror game with all the sounds and ambiance. Because of this app, there's very little setup. You open the box, you start the app, you pick some investigators, you toss down the starting tile, put your minis on it and go. It is amazing how accessible this game is due to the app doing all the work in the background and teaching you how to play as you play it. Now, I am not a big Mythos fan. This is the only Cthulhu game you're going to see on this list tonight, but I really dig this game. To me, Mansions of Madness feels like a board game version of a, a, a supernatural point and click adventure where it's all about not all about running around a big map trying to find clues it's more about looking in the right spot and more combat movement of miniatures it, it just to me is a much more enjoyable game than some of the other cthulhu based games out there and that was mansions of madness second edition next up we have horrified this mm. one is great for players of all ages featuring the classic universal monsters and a scalable difficulty that is great for making the game fun with kids as well as seasoned play game veterans. Now, personally, we only played the original, but I can see groups picking the American Monsters version just as easily, and that one features your classic U.S. cryptids. That was Horrified, published by Ravensburger, either the original Universal Monsters edition or the American Monsters version. Now, remember, this is our list of games we want to play on Halloween. So I apologize to all of you out there who can't actually get the next game I'm going to mention. And that is playing Aventuria, the adventure card game, and specifically playing the Forest of No Return adventure. While it looks like you can get Aventuria in North America again, I haven't seen this expansion available yet, unfortunately. Now, Aventuria is based on the German role-playing game The Dark Eye, which is a dark fantasy role-playing game, and all of the adventures we played so far, out of all of them, Forest No Return was definitely the darkest, with the most horror in it and horrific themes. This is a rather spooky story, and honestly one of our favorite games of all time, combined into one thing. And I am sorry you can't get a copy yourself. Well, that was the Forest of No Return adventure for the Aventuria Adventure card game. Now, next up, I don't think anyone's surprised that I'm a big deck builder fan and Legendaries Encounter, an alien deck building game, has the big thing of alien is tension. And what makes this game great is that it manages to actually build tension mm -hmm. through the use of hide cards that move uh, face down through the complex, eventually breaking out into the combat zone. 
These stay face down unless investigated, and you're constantly swapping between battling what's out there and preparing for what's coming next, while trying to avoid any surprises like a queen suddenly showing up. <laughs> now, being a legendary encounters game, this one is also a pure co-op that has players working together to defeat the Xenos threat. Yeah, so none of that weird stuff like in Marvel Legendary where you still have to figure out who won. <laughs> That was Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. Next, I have Ghostbusters, the board game. Now, remember, this is our list, not necessarily yours. For some reason, people don't like this game. People bash on it all the time. I know this is not a very popular game, but you know what? We actually enjoyed it, playing it with our family of four. Now, for one thing, it's a cooperative game that my wife actually enjoys, and that's fairly rare. Plus, that silly, kind of spooky theme of Ghostbusters to me is perfect for encapsulating Halloween as opposed to just horror. For Halloween game nights, I generally want a little bit of silly mixed in with my scary. Now, I added this one to the list when grabbing games for a backdrop. I was down there and I saw it and I was like, man, we haven't played that in a long time. You know, if we were going to game this Halloween, I would totally break that one out. So I had to toss it on the list. And that was Ghostbusters, the board game. Now, I know people out there who watch Tremors once a year on Halloween. Mm -hmm. And what better way to follow that up than playing a game of Terror Below? This is a silly, somewhat ridiculous game about battling giant burrowing creatures that you have to make sure to not take too seriously. It features a lot of take that moments, which may not be perfect for all groups. As long as you play it for what it is, we've had a lot of fun with Terror Below, even the fact that none of us are really take that kind of fans, no. uh, it still works at our table. That was Terror Below from Renegade Game Studios. All right, next I have Chaos in the Old World. And honestly, I put this on the list as I just want to play Chaos in the Old World again. I want to get it to my table, uh, specifically to try it with five players with the Horned Rat expansion that I unboxed earlier this year. So in this case, Halloween's honestly just an excuse to play a game I've wanted to play for quite some time. Now, I will say the Chaos Gods and Warhammer are quite horrific, so I still think it fits the theme. But really, it's an excuse for me. Now, for those who don't know this game, this is a highly asymmetric game set in the Warhammer fantasy world where you're going to take on the role of one of the Gods of Chaos, each of which has their own victory conditions and way to play. I honestly credit this game for being the game that got me into asymmetric board games. And that was, sadly, the way out of print chaos in the old world. Now, next up, I would love to run my kids through Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. I know Moe's family loved this game and had a great time playing it. I think my kids would enjoy it just as much. So far... This was our show's favorite Coded Chronicle game to date. We love the entire system of using character skills along with numbers on map tiles and cards to tell you what sections to read out of the book. Now, being Scooby, the theme is also perfect for a Halloween game with players of all ages. Yeah, I strongly recommend this one. This would be on my personal list, except I've already played it. So that's the one problem with this game is you can only play it once. Uh, maybe if you played that one, you break out the Goonies. Escape with uh, One-Eyed one -eyed Willie's Rich Stuff. I think that's the full <laughs> name of that one. Grab that one if you've already finished Scooby-Doo. That was Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansions, a Coded Chronicles game from The Op. Well, there you have it. 13 games we would be considering if we were having a Halloween-themed gaming event in 2022. As we mentioned at the top of the segment, we want to hear about the games you would bring to a Halloween gaming event. Please let us know in the comments or through social media. Now remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com. There you can click on Ask the Bellhop, or you can fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit us up on social media. You can find me everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our preview of Pocketbook Adventures, a game you can bring with you anywhere. Thanks, David, the designer, for sending us a prototype of this solo game to check out. Now, Pocketbook Adventures is the creation of David David. No, that's not me messing up. That's his name, David David. 
Now, he's currently crowdfunding a release of this game through Kickstarter, which is live and well-funded already, which is awesome. Now, this is being done through his company, Grumpy Spider Games, and this will be the second game from them. The first being Rucksack, which was successfully kickstarted last year, and from what I understand, in people's hands already. I have not tried that one myself. Now, Pocketbook Adventures is a solo dungeon crawl adventure, with each level taking only five to ten minutes to play through. All that's needed to play is a copy of the game and a pencil. While physical copies are only meant to be played once, through the Kickstarter, you also get PDFs for the entire thing, which you can print out as many copies as you wish. Now, one of the most impressive things about Pocketbook Adventures is the price point. At least right now on Kickstarter, I don't know what the retail levels are going to go be at, but on Kickstarter, it's 12 bucks US, including shipping to anywhere in the US. Now, for those of us outside the US, yes, we do have to worry about shipping, but I got to say so far, it seems very reasonable. Though, as we all know too well, shipping costs aren't final until you've received your package. Very true with Kickstarter. So in Pocketbook Adventures, you're presented with a classic JRPG-style map filled with terrain, treasures, uh, monsters, and an exit and a starting point. You start from the starting point and move orthogonally around the map, grabbing the treasures, battling monsters, and eventually leaving the map. You are then scored based on how many monsters you've killed, the amount of damage you've taken, and how many stops you made along the way. In addition, in between some adventures, you get to go to town, level up, buy items and weapons. At the end of each section of the adventure, there's also an interesting puzzle-based boss fight for you to get through. Now, due to our copy of Pocketbook Adventures being a prototype, we didn't do an unboxing video, though it ends up the production version is going to be very close to what we were sent. Yeah. Yeah, there isn't really a lot to talk about here. The entire game's one small pocket-sized spiral-bound book with a surprising number of pages. Uh, actually, to be honest, let's check. Is there a page count in here? And tell you exactly how many pages. Oh, there is not, unfortunately. So I didn't count them. There's at least 50 different areas, 50 different dungeons. And they each take up two pages. So you're looking at at least 100 pages. It's got to be a little bit more. Um, the cover and back are thicker card. Pages are paper. Like, as you'd expect, they're just thin paper. Nothing fancy, but you know what? It works for what this is. And the quality is obviously a big part of what let David set the price point at only 12 bucks. Now, more important to the game itself is that the iconography is clear and easy to read, as are the maps. I honestly have no complaints in regard to quality here. The instructions do take up the first few pages of the book are very clear and easy to understand. In addition, individual quests have some reminders on what specific icons mean. Though I did find for the first couple plays, I kept flipping back to see what things meant. Oh, I crossed over a single gold coin. What's that mean? Oh, get a gold. Oh, I crossed over a pile of coins. What's that mean? Oh, you have to hit the target and see how much gold you get. Like just a bit of referencing for the first couple of plays. Okay, so you've got a single book and a pencil. How does this all work as a solo RPG experience? How do you play Pocketbook Adventures? So playing Pocketbook Adventures couldn't be simpler. Once you read how to play, you flip to the first map. It's set in the grasslands and you begin. Now, each region in the game tells you how movement works. In the grasslands, you move one to four spots in a straight line. If you hit a wall, you turn 90 degrees, your choice left or right, and keep moving. You collect any treasure you pass over, but have to stop if you run into a monster. Now, if you stop in any of the eight squares surrounding a monster, you must fight that monster. Treasure chests require keys to open, and there's one key and one chest on each map, and must be stopped on directly. So to get a chest, you actually have to stop on it, not just pass over. Now, each map includes one exit that you'll need to reach to finish that map. So pretty straightforward. Move, turn, and fight on your way to the exit. Now, treasure you can pick up includes gold, which you can spend later to buy healing items and weapons, hearts that heal you, heart containers that give you additional max HP and a total Zelda vibe, gold piles that reward one to five gold, and various items like remedies that heal status effects and pixie dust, which heals you. In general, you're going to want to try to pick up as much as you can before leaving a map. Uh, so, I mean, this is sounding pretty much like a paper version of Rogue, but without yeah. monsters moving on their own. <laughs> yeah, this there's definitely a very roguelike field, except obviously things aren't randomly generated. 
it's going to be the same every time you play through it, though you're only meant to play through it once. So I guess you're getting that rogue feel and then every map's different when you flip the page. Now, combat in Pocketbook Adventures is one of the most unique and innovative parts of this game. Every monster on the map has a spot on the previous page showing the monster icon, as well as like a line on top of it with a dot. Underneath that is a bullseye style target below it. To attack, you put your pencil tip on the dot, close your eyes, lift off the pencil, and put it down onto the bullseye. You're going to take no damage if you hit the bullseye, one damage for every ring going outward. In addition, each monster has a special attack, and these are shaded in areas of the target, like the bullseye. If you point at one of those, you're affected by whatever the special attack is, which is spelled out on the page. Now, these special attacks include all kinds of fun things, some of which are permanent until you get to use a remedy to get rid of them. Early monster abilities can even help you. For example, the goblin that you fight in the first dungeon, if you hit a special, you scared him and he drops gold. The pixie, if you hit a special there, she heals you. Later monsters, though, are much more punishing, invite, inflicting statuses like sting. If you get sting stung, sting stung stung. If you get stung twice, you take three extra damage. And empty, which means you've got no will to fight and won't heal yourself while you're moving around. Well, that's certainly a fun and innovative resolution system. Mm -hmm. Now, one very real possibility when playing pocket adventures, pocketbook adventures is dying, but it's no big deal in this game. You either lose half of your collected gold or drop your weapon and items. You then go back up to full health and the monster that killed you is still alive. So you're going to have to fight it again. There is no permadeath here in this game. Too bad fans of a uh, hardcore mode. <laughs> But I'm sure you could really house rule your own if you really wanted to become a dad. Yeah, there's a, I, I could totally see there being gamers out there who try to play through the entire thing without dying. I'm sure that's a thing. Now, once you finish a map by leaving out the exit, you then get a score. Uh, very, this, this reminds me of playing some type of app, right? You're going to get a bunch of stars. You're, you're going to get up to three stars in three different areas with a maximum of nine points. The first is how many monsters you kill. Next is how much damage you took with, of course, more stars for less damage. And last is how many stops you made on the map with a max score of nine. A pretty simple, some might even say simplistic scoring system. Uh, it doesn't really feel like there's a real range to compete against other players' scores here, though. Uh, well, I can see comparing how you did on individual maps because the scores do range from zero to nine. I think the real comparisons to be done at the end of each section. And, well, of course, your final game score, which I'll talk about calculating that later. Like, I can totally see someone going online and saying, hey, have you played Pocketbook Adventures? What'd you score in the Grasslands? Okay. Now, after recording your stars, you're going to flip the page and see what's next. I don't recommend looking ahead. It's more fun if you discover it as you're playing. Now, most of the time, this is just going to be the next map. You carry over your health, gold, and items, sorry, health, gold, items, and weapon from the last map and just keep playing. Now and then, though, when you flip, you're going to get to find a town. Here, you can pay gold to level up. Now, you pay a set amount of gold and try to hit a bullseye target. The bigger the target, the more gold you spend. So if, or so, so if you spend seven gold, you got a nice big target to aim for. Whereas if you only spend two gold, you got a little tiny target. Well, if you hit the target in any of the rings, you get one max hit point. And each town includes at least three different size targets. Now, one thing I didn't know when I was playing through this that I've now had clarified by the designer is that if you have the gold, you can try more than once. But any misses do mean your gold is lost. Now in town, you can also heal up, remove status effects, and buy useful items like remedies and pixie dust. Finally, every time you're in town, you get a chance to buy a weapon. You can only ever hold one weapon, and they aren't cheap. Now weapons give you some form of permanent advantage going forward while it's equipped. For example, my first weapon I bought while playing was a thieves knife which meant I didn't have to have the key to open chests, which made it way easier to finish the dungeons in less steps. I later swapped out for something called the Outer Light Sword, which has me draw a little heart in all the monster targets, Outer Rings. And what it means is I take one less damage when I happen to hit there. So for me, the bullseye zero damage, the middle ring is one damage, and the outer ring is only one damage for me as well. So it definitely sounds like picking not just a weapon, but your weapon is a vital aspect of the game. 
Uh, definitely earlier on, but they're going to start teasing you with more and more interesting things. I, this is the one aspect of the game. I almost wish I could make a collection of weapons and pick which one to use when I get to the next map. Uh, for example, one of the healing wands is you pick three hearts that are on the board, put a plus in them. Well, those heal too. Well, if I know it's going to be a fight with lots of fights that I'm worried about losing, I would rather have that than my light outer sword, for example. Now, the other thing you can find after flipping the page, and it's usually after quite a few dungeons and a couple stops at town, is a boss fight. Now, there's one of these in each region, and each has special rules for how to play them. Now, to me, these seem like, like, like something that I'd consider a spoiler, so I'm going to leave those for you to discover on your own. Now, after you do defeat the boss, you're going to add up all your stars for that region and then record it at the start. So when you finish the Grasslands boss fight, you go back to the first Grasslands page and record your stars. Um, you then flip the page again and find out where you're delving next. Now, again, I don't want to give too much away, but the big thing that does change in later maps is how movement happens. Now, in at least one region, the game becomes more of a puzzle specifically one of those slider puzzles where you're going to move in a straight line until you hit something, then you stop. Later in the adventure, you're in the deeper, darker dungeons. And in that point, you're blinded. So movement becomes random and you actually use the blind pencil point to move. So you literally are on the map. You close your eyes and put a dot and that's where you move to. And of course, future boss monsters each have their own tricks and systems. Certainly sounds like they didn't skimp on gameplay in this small little book now once you finally do get to the end of the book you total up all your scores for all the regions and you look up on a chart to get your title now what you're getting is three different titles three parts of your title and it's for each of the three things you're scoring right so there's a, there's a title for how many times how, how you didn't exploring a title for or how much damage you took and a title for how many monsters you killed now, there's a page at the back of the book, like for a memorandum, hey, I finished it, where you fill out your character name and you write down your title and you can save that for prosperity's sake. Okay, well, now that we've heard about the game, let's hear about your overall thoughts on the game. All right, so when David David first reached out to me about this one, I thought the concept sounded pretty neat. This honestly seemed like the perfect thing for me to play while sitting in the car waiting for my mom or the kids at whatever appointment they have each day. Sometimes I feel like more of a chauffeur than a father sometimes. And I was totally right. This game is perfect for that. What I didn't expect, though, is just how much fun playing through one of these short map-based adventures really is. This is honestly the perfect example of a game that actually exceeded my expectations. This sounds like a great game for people who play those idle games on their phone or other time-killer apps mm -hmm. and would like to do something else or have lousy phone batteries. Totally true. Honestly, I found the entire thing to just be physically brilliant, like like just brilliant overall, like the physical design. The size really is perfect for fitting in a, at least denim jeans pocket, which is what I tend to wear. The spiral is wide enough to actually slide a pencil in there, which is nice. And the cover is just thick enough to protect the pages, though what you want to do is leave it open on the last page you're on. That's not great because the paper's kind of thin, so you may not want to toss it in your pocket. You'll probably want to close it first. Now, I do wish the text was a little bigger. It's a little small, but I admit I'm aging and I have aging eyes and that's not going to be a problem for everyone. Uh, there isn't really a lot you need to read once you're actually moving around on the map, though. So it sounds like they dropped the ball a little bit on having a you know custom divider or uh, something to keep your place. Uh, even yeah. something as simple as a small ribbon that you could tie off to the, the rings to drop in. I guess it's easy enough to hack yourself and toss in. Plus, anything that up the price point, I wouldn't want to add to this. Like I say, I think the, the real shining thing in this is the, the amount of game you're getting for the price. As for the rules, they were perfectly clear. Uh, they made perfect sense reading through them for the first time. Uh, though I got to say, they didn't really give me a good idea of how it would feel playing. Just how engaging the game is. Like I'm reading, I'm like, yep, you, you move kind of like one of those puzzles. Oh, OK, that's neat. Yeah, I can see how that works. Oh, and if I pass over that, I get, okay, that makes sense. But it's not until you actually play that you see how well that all works together. Right. Well, it's an interesting change from games that tend to oversell in the instructions. Yeah, true. This one, this one sets the expectations really well. What really does shine here, though, is playing. Like, like actually playing through one of these mazes. Uh, the mechanics here just work, and they work perfectly. Like, the movement system is brilliant. 
And I got to say, if it's David David or if he had some help, whoever designed those maps did a great job of putting things in just the right spot so there is generally an optimum way to move. I also liked how the difficulty ramped up. Like at first it was really easy to get under the the stop steps. Like what I, 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 like I did this in 16 and I had 22 steps for three stars. How could you take so many more? And well, at first you're like, Oh, I only have to kill seven monsters. There's like 12 on this board. So I got to pick and choose. But then later on, like one of the, the thing I now do when I go to a new map is I go, okay, what's the, what's the kill target? Okay. I have to kill some monsters. How many monsters on the map? Crap. There's 10 monsters on the map. So to get max points, I got to kill them all. And then it started getting a lot harder on the getting out in time. Uh, One of the key rules is if you go back to a spot that doesn't count, it's the number of spaces you stop on, not the amount of stops. So I definitely got better at backtracking while playing this game. And I really dig it. Like like there's, we talked about this on previous podcast episodes and that, that onboarding is something I'd love to see more of in more, more games. And the onboarding on here is is seamless like like a video game you don't realize they're onboarding you but they really are by keeping things easy and ramping them up well certainly sounds like it got one fan out of all of this at the very least (laughs) yeah Uh, it's true uh honestly the the true highlight though that the the most fun is honestly this i don't want to i want to call it stupid but like the silly blind points pencil point system I don't know i don't have a term for this there should be a term for this new mechanic and we can put it on our giant list of mechanics the blind points pencil point or something like it just sounds silly, but it works so well. And I have played this game like sitting in a car with it, you know, up against my steering wheel. I've done it laying down on the couch with it kind of floating above my head. And I played sitting at a table and this pointing system works for all of these. Now, I do recommend if you are like covering your book, you just, you know, have it in half. Don't try to play it with both pages open because it's a little floppy that way. but. It would still work. Though I will say using the table, I was a little more accurate. So maybe if you want the best score, you might want to try to play on the table. Now, the other thing I do dig about this is that it's now relegating your combat results to actual player skill. Like this is really, it's a mini dexterity game. And I think I prefer this to say the randomness of dice. Because I got to say, I have been way happier and shouting out loud for hitting a bullseye when I only have one health left and I can remember ever being happy, say, rolling a 20 in a game of D&D at the right moment. And I think it's because I know I did it. I pointed that pencil. Look, I nailed it. I got that bullseye. And actually, if you watch the video on their Kickstarter page, they highlight a bunch of people playing the game that are either hitting or missing right on and their reactions. Like I literally shouted out enjoy in my car and line for the kiss and ride at my daughter's school and got a bunch of sidelong glances from the other parents at the time because I was so happy that I survived a particular attack. Now, that being said, I suspect that this does, to a small part, limit those who will find this game playable. Certain limiting abilities may impact your ability to perform this accurately, while rolling a dice might not be an issue. If you do have any sort of grasping or dexterity control issues, this may not be right for you. Yeah, actually thinking about that, it's kind of sad they didn't give you an alternative system just in case, because like we personally know a player who would not be able to play this game because of handshaking issues. And and I can totally see that, which is something as an able person I didn't even consider. So it's something, you know what, I'll, I'll send a message off to David, David, just say, hey, you might want to include some kind of die result table or something just in case for people who can't do that. Now, the final thing I do want to call out in regards to Pocketbook Adventures is the fact it hasn't gotten boring. Uh, My biggest concern with this game when I first signed up to review it was that I thought it would feel the same game after game. But David's done enough different things with this game to keep it interesting. Now, this includes different monster types and terrain on different maps. Not once is the same set of three monsters you're facing. Uh, the various different status effects that the monsters do, and then later in the game, completely different movement systems and the unique boss fights. Well, I will admit, after I play like three in a row, I'm kind of done for now. I don't need feel like playing a fourth, but I'm always ready, willing, and excited to go back, say, a day or two later. So it sounds like it's well done for a sort of daily uh, coffee time play or tea time, if we want to go back to the Gale references, yes. uh, before work or, or on your lunch break. Not too much, just enough if you just, you know, get a little bit of time in there every day. Yeah, with games only taking 5-10 minutes, it's perfect break time game. 
Now, normally we like to highlight the good and the bad in our previews. And honestly, it's kind of hard to come up with much bad to say about Pocketbook Adventures. Uh, the biggest problem in this game here is you can only play this once. Like, this is actually a problem for Deanna and I, because Deanna saw me playing and was like, okay, that actually looks pretty cool. Can I try? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't want you to play my next map. I want to get my own score. Um, so what I actually did is I went in and completely erased my first map and then let her play through it. But then, like me, she was hooked. She's like, okay, now I want to keep playing. And I'm like, well, what do I do? Do I go through and erase every game after I play it? And and then we just track our stars separately? Like, I guess that works. Um, of course, the real answer is pick up a second copy, right? Like, get one for Deanna. Um, and while my prototype doesn't have it there, there's a, there's a placeholder. There will be a QR code in the back where you can do that, where you can order additional copies or download the print and play. Maybe print and plays, excuse me, maybe print and play is our solution. But it just, it's such a nice one and done book that I hate print and play uses a full eight and a half by 11 sheet. And it's kind of in the middle and I'm not going to take the time to bind all that. I don't know. It, it It's, it, it, this is a one and done product really. That's how it's designed. And it's going to take you a while. Like I said, there's, there's what a hundred maps in here. It looks like. So it's going to take you some time to get to the end, but it is a one use product. I uh, honestly, for me, this was kind of the deal breaker. Now, while it's certainly better than some of the escape room games uh, that all have all sorts of components and things and a much higher yeah. price point, I really am disappointed that I can't pass it on and let someone else try and beat my score. Yeah, that's fair. Now, one hack we did think of is don't use a pencil, use a pen or use colored pencils and then play with different colors. So like I go through and I play with uh, with a green pencil and then D goes through and plays with the red pencil. I think that might actually work. Although you, 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 you know, whoever played second would be, yeah, you know, having a, an idea of, of sort of best solutions or possible. Oh yeah, there is that too. Yeah. yeah, you might be giving away your strategies. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Especially on the puzzle levels. Yeah, I can totally see that. Um, the other problem I can see with this particular product, though, I think at this point, anyone who's even looking at this game has already bought into this fact is this is a solo experience. Um, th this is not a big book. This isn't isn't something I can see working well as a group. Like, I guess you could kind of put it down in the center of your table and have everyone kind of look at it and go, OK, which way should we move? And then, like, maybe pass it around when people can do different combat. But you know what? I can't see it. This, this is a solo game. It's meant to be played that way. Yeah, I, I think at least uh, that part is pretty clear. You'd have to really stretch to try and pick this up for more than one player. Like, I suppose if you had the print and play and printed it out on, like, le stretch to ledger size paper, you could do yeah. it. But, uh, yeah, no. But even then, like, oh, who, do we should we go up, down, or left, or right? Like, I honestly, I've seen streamers play this game now, and that's what they kind of did with their chat, which kind of works. So it can be a group experience. Like, honestly, for me, like, this is the my my alone time when I'm trying to kill times game. And when I have other people to play games, I'll go play a multiplayer game. Yeah. All right. Overall, Pocketbook Adventures, honestly, is one of the best game experiences playing through it. Here's what here's one of my completed maps for those of you who are actually here watching is actually one of the best gaming experiences I've had this year. And I'm, me saying this, it's a solo game. This is a fantastic product that does exactly what it sets out to do. It gives you a book full of dungeons and puzzles to explore on your own, a book that you can easily toss into a pocket, into your gym bag or whatever, probably fit this in a dice bag, and you can bring it with you almost anywhere and play anytime you got 10 minutes free. It only requires you to have a pencil on hand, and through that brilliant blind pencil pointing system, I think that's what I've decided it's called, it's the BPP system, um, it lets you experience a puzzle-based RPG experience. It's kind of got that JRPG feel. Uh, with plenty of variety as you get through the book. If you're at all interested in ever playing a solo dungeon crawler, I encourage you to head over to Kickstarter right now and back Pocketbook Adventures. Only $12 US, and that includes US shipping. Like, this is really a no-brainer to me. I know I have already gotten more than $12 worth of fun out of my book so far, and I'm not even halfway through. Really, the only people who shouldn't be checking this out are people who are completely and totally against playing anything solo. But honestly, I kind of even want to go to them and show it to them and say, hey, just try it. And I have a feeling it's going to win over some people who are like, ah, solo games stink. I have a feeling this could win you over. 
Now, if you are on the fence, if you've heard all this and I haven't sold you on this, take this challenge. Go to the Kickstarter page, download the sample page. That'll let you try it for yourself. It's actually the first Grassland Dungeon in full. You can try it out yourself and let me know if it's sold down. Well, that's it for our review of Pocketbook Adventures, which is live now on Kickstarter. So far, this is our biggest surprise of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, what's impressed you the most in 2022? Let us know in the comments below. Now, before I go, I also want to invite you to check out my written review of Pocketbook Adventures, which will be posted over at tabletopbellhop.com once it goes live. I get into a little bit more detail of how things work and share lots of pictures from my actual book. Welcome to our review of The Ghosts Betwixt, a modern dungeon crawler set in America's haunted heartland. Thank you, Innocent Traveler Games, for sending us a copy of this game to check out. So The Ghost Betwixt is the first game from Dustin Freund and his company Innocent Traveler Games. It was first published in 2021 after a successful Kickstarter. It features artwork from Travis Hansen and Cole Munro Chitty. Now this is a one to four player campaign based dungeon crawler with individual games that can take an entire game night to finish. Some of our games lasting over five hours. You can pick up The Ghosts Betwixt just in time for Halloween direct from Innocent Traveler Games for $60 USD plus shipping, which I've got to say isn't a bad price at all considering all the stuff you get and the length of the main, cam main campaign. So the Ghost Betwix is a modern dungeon crawling board game where your family of five is investigating a horror theme park that's long shut down in search of one of the kids who's been kidnapped by someone on the grounds. You do this by th playing through a multi-episode campaign where each section features randomly determined elements like room placement and position and what's in each room, making each playthrough totally unique. The game features a mix of exploration and dice pool based combat with your characters leveling up, learning and improving their skills and talents and finding new gear. Now, despite its somewhat Saturday morning cartoon look, this is actually a meaty dungeon crawler approaching the complexity level of heavier dungeon crawlers like Gloomhaven. Now, for a look at all the stuff you get in the box, including a ton of cardboard and custom dice, check out our Ghosts Betwixt unboxing video on YouTube. Now, there's a lot in this box, and I don't think it's worth going through bit by bit here on our podcast. So instead, I'm just going to highlight a few things that stuck out. Now, the game features three different books that you'll be swapping between a lot during play. One is meant to be a learn to play book. The next is a reference book. And the last is the adventure book. Sadly, these are not the best written books out there, but more about that when we get to our thoughts on the game. The room tiles and counters are nice and thick and two sided. The custom dice are easy to distinguish and read, though I do wish there were more of them as halfway through the adventure, we're now having to re-roll dice often. The various cards in the game are of good quality and finish and have held up to a lot of shuffling. So one thing you won't find here that many people expect from a dungeon crawling board game are minis. Yeah. What you get instead are a number of cardboard standees and stands to hold them and stickers to put on some of those stands to differentiate multiples of the same monster type. Now, overall, the component quality is good to excellent with the biggest problem actually being figuring out how to organize all the stuff. Due to how long it's going to take the average group to get through just one campaign of the Ghost Betwixt and the possibility you may replay it, I think most groups are going to want to invest in some form of third-party organizer for this game. In this case, baggies just don't cut it. There are too many different tokens, cards, standees, and bits to keep track of. Yeah, they really don't. Right now, my copy is a mix of baggies and a single plano box, and I wish I'd done more. This is one of those games that because of this, I now try to set up before people get to my house so that we can start playing right away. And we'll often leave set up until after they leave just to clean up on my own so we don't need to eat into that precious gameplay time. Now, before we move on, I want to point out that during this review, I am going to be mentioning some things going forward that some people might consider spoilers. Now, the thing is, I don't think these things should be spoilers. 
And I'm going to be totally sure not to spoil any of the story or the big surprises. There are some things, though, that the designers chose to keep from beginning players that I wish I had known going in. Due to that, I'm going to call these things out for anyone who's considering picking up the game because I think they will impact whether this will be a right game for your group or not. Well, with that warning in place, let's move on to an overview of play. So the Ghost Betwixt is a campaign-based dungeon crawler that's meant to be played in a linear faction, at least up to Chapter 4. Each main chapter is meant to be played once, though can be replayed if you fail. Eventually, you'll unlock scavenger hunt missions. These are different in that you're expected to play them multiple times, and they can be played in any order and even between later missions. Now, as a campaign game, everything you earn in one mission does carry over to the next. That said, this game is replayable mm. due to the amount of randomly determined things during each chapter. Each time you play through an individual mission, it will play differently from the last. This not only makes the game stay engaging when you die, but it also means the same group of players could play through it multiple times and it would be a unique experience each time, or at least the action would be. The yeah. story, not so much. Now, once you've decided which mission, which mission you're playing, and again, they go in a logical order, there's quite a bit of setup to do. This involves gathering the proper room tiles, gathering the right monster standees, gathering the monster cards for the appropriate monsters, and other components used in that mission. Now, a big part of this is making what they call token piles, which is what's used to randomly determine what's in each room and the order the rooms come up. Now, individual missions may also have additional setup rules you have to follow as well. Now, there is a lot to track in this game, and mm. they've given you all the pieces to do that. But it means that there's a lot of usually small things on that table. Yes. Now, each mission starts with four family members start up, set up on a starting tile with the first objective card for that mission revealed. This card will tell you what you need to do to complete it and progress the mission to the next stage. Now, most missions start with what the game calls the exploration phase. Here, you're moving around the map, opening doors, and while exploring. Now, what's brilliant here, and this is something I would love to see carried over in other dungeon crawlers, is there's no initiative, there's no turn order, and you don't even count spaces square by square. You just move your standees to where you want to be and do a thing, like search the room or open a door. Searching rooms is done by making a test. These are done by rolling a number of D6 based on one of your family members' total focus points and looking for the sixes. The most sixes, the better. What you find is determined by the room type and the mission. Now, opening doors is actually a new phase. So once everyone's lined up at a door, you go, I open a door, you now switch to a different mode of play, I guess, or another subsystem. Here, you're going to flip over the random room number token assigned to that door, which will tell you what room to place there. You're then going to flip over three exploration counters to determine what's in that room. Now, these counters can include monsters, traps, vending machines, story points, more doors, and a ton of other stuff. All coming from those tokens you set up at the beginning of the mission. Again, more tokens, more fiddly. Now, it's I think it's worth it because of the variety and flexibility of the game. But there is, I cannot state enough, a lot to manage here, which mm -hmm. I feel like I'm going to say a lot during this review. <laughs> now, here's an interesting bit. You've got your new room. You've showed your tokens. If you don't draw enough doors to cover all the exits from this room you've drawn, you continue for one more room, drawing another room number, drawing another three tokens from that room and spawning everything, which can actually lead to some really interesting map layouts and more importantly, really neat sprawling fights over multiple rooms. This is something else I have not seen in any other dungeon crawler. But be warned, this game can be a table hog. Yeah. A 4x4 four four table isn't enough to handle a four-player game of this between the map and player boards and cards and tokens. Yeah, not easily. You can, you can make it work, um, and depending on the way the room spread, you can probably try to keep things condensed, but yeah. It can take a lot of table. Now you continue exploring like this and opening doors until you reveal a room with monsters in it by drawing one or more monster tokens. 
Now, what's neat on these is these are also randomized and they're numbered, and each number represents a different set of baddies determined by the mission. You then spawn the baddies into the room with their token, or in the room with the family if you also drew an ambush token, and combat begins. And this is where the game hits its stride. So combat switches play to a more traditional turn-based board game feel, with one family member acting, then one group of baddies, then another family member, another group, and so on. Each family member's turn, they can do two things, which most, both must be different. These include moving, swapping equipment, using items, taking a defensive or offensive stance, attacking using a family member's unique talent, or taking mission-specific actions, which of course are going to change depending on what your objective and goals are. Now, enemies move based on a simple AI that uses a very cool targeting system where each monster picks a target based on drawing a random family member chip from a pile or a bag if you have the deluxe edition. Now, this basic system is the monster gets as close as they have to to attack, then does so. Now, many enemies also have what's called the hit and run ability, which will then have them back off. There are both rules for ranged and melee attack types, and the ranged line of sight system is dead simple. But for all the management and complexity, the combat system is really quite simple and straightforward, and mm -hmm. in some ways, the shining star of this whole game. Now, actual combat rolls are made using custom dice, with these dice split into attack dice, defense dice, and damage dice. The dice pool you're rolling is made based on the family member's abilities and equipment, as well as the monster stat shown on their monster card. Now, some monsters will also get randomly generated abilities that will modify this pool. You then roll all of the dice, and you got a pretty basic, almost hero quest-like system of shields and dodges canceling out hits, where you're going to then total the leftover hits and compare them to the target's agility to see if you hit. For 90% of the monsters in this game, and for all family members, you just need one hit to hit. Now, damage, though, is done separately based on a damage die, with the attacker then getting to spend any diamond symbols to set off special effects. You've seen this in many other dungeon crawling games with some special symbol that triggers powers, which are listed on all the cards. Um, you can do additional damage with this, elemental damage, shoving monsters, and all kinds of interesting special effects and status effects. That's it. One pretty straightforward die pool, and it's all resolved. Now, combat continues round after round until all enemies are defeated. The family then gets rewarded. In a very video gamey feel, you're going to pull cards from what's called the drop deck to see what drops you got. You're going to draw one card for every enemy token that you spawned, and you're going to get XP. XP is awarded both for the entire family, equal to the XP of all the monsters in the fight, as well as giving bonus XP to the family members who dealt killing blows for each of the monsters. You literally take the monster off the map and put it on your character board, so at the end of the fight, it's easy to calculate what XP you get. Now, the drop deck contains all kinds of things like items and equipment, money in the form of Bennert Bucks, uh, books that teach weapon proficiencies, and more. Uh, one reward we want to specifically call out are monster trophies. Mm -hmm. When you get these, record the trophy number on the bottom right of the monster card somewhere. Note, you can have multiple copies of the same reward. So each time this card comes up, be sure to record all of your trophies. This isn't something that's clearly stated in the rulebook. Yeah, we messed this one up pretty bad. Realize that monster trophies are a currency you will get to spend later. After finishing off combat, the game swaps back to the exploration phase and play continues until you complete the objective on the first objective card. Once you do, we'll flip over, do what it says, and continue on. Most missions have at least four objectives you have to go to, and these are all over the place as to what they do are asking you to do. Uh, common repeating objectives include revealing certain tokens when exploring, finishing set combats, and opening specific doors, but there's a whole lot more. Oh, yeah. Now, once you complete the final mission objective, you have complete, uh, completed that mission and get some big rewards, usually in the form of XP, based on how much health the entire family has left and draws from the rare equipment decks. After that, everyone earns XP and you can level up. Now, each party member has 
10 levels they can achieve while playing through the Ghost Betwix. And each level requires more XP to reach. This is going to be really familiar for most RPG players, especially traditional RPGs. Now, the interesting thing here, though, is the XP is spent when achieving a new level. So when you level up, you actually spend your XP to get to that level. Now, at each level, you're going to unlock weapon proficiencies, which uh, quickly just give you rerolls, uh, talents, as well as the ability to level up existing talents. Talents are the asymmetric part of this game. They are unique abilities that differ for each family member. For example, Joan, the mom, is good at healing, and Maddox loves firecrackers. Now, at each talent level, though, when you go to, like, level two talents, you're going to get two to pick from. And because of this, there are some really neat ways to customize each character so they suit your play style. Plus, it gives you replayability because you can play through a second time and go with a totally different build for each of the characters. So, of course, uh, <laughs> of course, the other way a scenario can end is a total party kill. If all family members get knocked down to zero health, the game ends immediately. Everyone gets to keep anything they found in the adventure so far, but they do lose half their Bennert bucks. They also lose any personal XP and bonus XP they gained, only getting the group family XP they'd earned up to the point before the final fight. Now that's honestly pretty high level. That, that, that is an overview of play. This is a complex, involved dungeon crawler with a lot going on. We didn't even touch on aspects like elemental damage, or the four different kinds of traps, or rare equipment decks, or buying and selling items, or the ridiculous number of different status effects, both positive or negative, or the fact facing matters when you're moving. But I think this gives you a pretty good overview of how the game plays. Just realize you're not looking at a light, silly, roll and move adventure game like Hero Quest. You're looking at something more on the level of Imperial Assault or Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Now, with that overview done, it's time to move on to our thoughts on the Ghost Betwixt. So the biggest problem with this game, and I've kind of already hinted at this, is mixed expectations and missed expectations. Going back to when I agreed to review this game, up until we finished Scenario 4, we were still discovering things about this game we didn't expect, and not in a good surprise kind of way. The biggest shock to me, and what I think is going to be the most important thing people need to know when considering picking up the Ghost Betwix, is despite the Saturday morning cartoon look, this is not in any way a kid's game. Well, the game is clear about it. It says 14 plus on the box. The cartoony look and spooky but not scary looking theme makes it look like a kid's game. This is not a kid's game, both in rules complexity as well as content. Now, I wouldn't say this is an adult game that's definitely not an 18 plus or rated R, but there are situations in the game that are better suited to playing with people, at least in their teens. Now, when I signed up to review this game, I expected to be playing a light hero quest style spooky horror romp with my kids. Instead, it turned into a Gloomhaven-esque campaign game that I play with Kat and Tori. It's really an art style issue. I hesitate to say, hesitate to say problem. But we have heard from others who had the same confusion we did. Mm -hmm. The colorful art on the box gives a different expectation from the rest of the information pre presented. Yes, the box does say it's for 14 plus. But how often have we seen that and, and looked at the game and wondered why it was rated 18, 14 plus or mm -hmm. noted that it's only due to small components that it's rated 14 plus? Now, I don't have a solution but I do think that it's a concern from a marketing standpoint mm -hmm. for this product. Now, the best big shock for me was how much of this game the designers chose to hide from you from the start. I just, this confuses me. So one of the biggest being that this is not a six game campaign. Everything, when I looked into this game, when I read through it, when I looked at the mission box to me said six plays. When we review games, we try to play them at least five times. And I'm like, well, one more time. We'll play this six times and we'll finish the whole thing before I review it. That shouldn't be a problem. And if well, we lose one, we'll play one more. Little did I know that in the middle of the campaign, I was going to unlock more missions. These are the scavenger hunt missions, the ones you can play multiple times. I thought those were totally optional. They're not. With these in the game, you are looking at a minimum of nine games to finish the mission 
And trust me, there's a good chance you're going to be replaying a couple anyway, even if you just try to play each once. Now, again, that's not really a bad thing. Actually, nine missions is better than six when you're looking at replayability and value for money. But it's a fact I didn't know that I was in for nine missions when I signed up. This is one of those things that most groups are going to love. More playability. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. But combined with the unmatched expectation in what the game was, as mentioned before, it did make this tougher to review than expected. Yeah. Regulars listeners know we give games their chance. We don't play a game once or twice and then give superficial opinions. But that got tough for this game. Yeah. Now, sticking with things I wish I knew going in, there are other things in this game that just were oddly obfuscated. For example, the monster trophy rules. I don't understand why they couldn't present these right in the beginning of the book. If they want to hide what they did, they just had to say, hey, if you draw one of these, note this number somewhere. Don't worry about it for now. And note, you can get it more than once. And then all they had to say is monster trophies are a currency you'll get to spend later. Just wait for it. Something like that. Like, why wasn't that in there? Instead, they tried to hide it. Like there was some cool surprise you were going to find later. Similarly, I think they, they could have been way more clear about selling equipment. Like it's in the basic rules that you can sell for one third of the cost. That should have been mentioned that you won't be able to sell anything until you finish a specific mission and then be very clear when you can. Or even better, if you wanted to hide it, don't mention I could sell anything. If they had never mentioned selling, I wouldn't be questioning how do I sell until it came up. I just would have never known. I would have been like, oh, cool. I can now sell things. And I also would have liked to have seen, don't, you can't sell to a vending machine. Yes, I get it. That's not how vending machines work in reality, but I played enough games in my life that I can sell to vending machines, mostly video games, but trust me, follow Borderlands and many more. I've sold plenty of items to video games. I just... Why did they hide this stuff? It, I, I find it frustrating. And yes, I realize there's slight spoilers here. Eventually, you get to sell stuff, but I don't think that's game breaking. And I wish I had known when we sat down to play the first time. Unfortunately, the rule book is filled with these kinds of ambiguities, and it really doesn't help that the rules are spread over three books. Mm -hmm. There are currently 40 threads in the rules section, Board Game Geek, filled with rules questions on the Ghost Betwixt. I'm sorry, but the designer stepping in and saying the rules there, it's on page X, is great. But it shows how poorly organized things are by the number of times he's been required to step in and yeah. say, oh, but the rule is there on page X. Yeah, this game, uh, more so than many we played, could use a 2.0 version of all three books. Uh, personally, I think I'd combine the how to play book and the reference one into one or at least completely rewrite the onboarding book because it was terrible. It, and most of the book was referenced the other book. I, it, it, this was not a good way to learn the game. It basically took us just playing and fumbling and looking and Googling and board game geek surfing to be able to get through it all. And no, this is not a preview. We are not looking at a preview copy of the game. We are looking at the retail version of the game that you can buy in stores. So it's not just a the game wasn't done yet problem in this case feel like we're sounding a bit like a broken record here, but many of the Kickstarter games we receive that are not supported by an established publisher are suffering not from concept or gameplay or, or mechanics, but from rule books. Yeah. And this one is no different. What is a solid and detailed dungeon crawler with character growth and intriguing map development and a fantastic combat system is hobbled by not one, but three books which confuse and leave the players unsure if they've made a mistake or if the rules are wrong or if they've missed something. Now, one more negative before we do give the Ghost Betwixt some redemption here. My final complaint, which again is an issue of mixed expectation, is the gameplay time. While our initial plays were long, like, like way over the two-hour time limit on the box, they did include a lot of time referencing rules and searching Board Game Geek and trying to figure things out. So I didn't complain about it too much. But the thing is, even once we got the rules down and everyone knew what they were doing, our games of the Ghost Betwixt were taking over four hours regular. Now, I don't mind spending four hours on a single game, but to me, that's a different type of game that I want for a different type of game night. Now, the Ghost Betwixt has become a, a, a lifestyle game, an event game. It's the game we play. We get together and we play Ghost Betwixt. Heck, our last game, we even tried to play quickly. We're like, you know what? I want to do the review. I want it live before Halloween. 
Let's sit down and see if we can hammer through two. And we tried to play fast and it just didn't work. Now, the biggest problem is, yes, the combat is fantastic. Yes, it's the biggest part of the game. It's the draw of the game. But man, the combats can drag on. And the problem there is a whiff factor. With most of the damage dice having a zero side, one of them having more than one, and the amount of defense dice both monsters and family members have, there are just a lot of rounds where the dice get rolled and nothing happened. This can make a single fight take well over an hour to finish. And so far, it seems to be getting worse as the campaign goes on, as defenses on both sides are going up. Now, this is a tough one, as again, much of it has to do with those incorrect expectations set mm. early on. Yet at the same time, rulebook problems combined with the exploration and combat systems do stretch it out. Mm. It's hard to say if this is really a negative or not, and will really come down to your group and if they want to play a lifestyle game. Yeah, that, that like, yes, I just listed a ton of negatives, but like Sean just mentioned, most of these, actually pretty much all of them, except for that whiff factor and ambiguous rules, are a matter of mismatched expectations. They're not really bad things. And they wouldn't even be problems if I'd known about them ahead of time. If I knew I was signing up to play a heavy dungeon crawler that's going to be an epic game night experience every time we play, and it's going to take a minimum of nine games to finish, I probably wouldn't have complained at all. Okay, maybe a bit about the four-hour game length, but I definitely wouldn't have this many complaints as I have. Because the thing is, we've actually enjoyed our plays of the Ghost Be Twix. This is a solid dungeon crawler with a unique theme. The story's been compelling. The system of exploring, opening doors, and combats actually works brilliantly. I have did enjoy the very predictable first end to scenario three reveal, which I think I, if any group surprised by that, I'd be shocked. But I liked the way that changed the game. And again, I don't want to spoil anything that way. I dig the new stuff we've unlocked, despite wishing it was kind of explained a little better earlier. And I admit, the one game that did lead to a TPK was frustrating. And that night, we weren't feeling all too happy about Ghost Betwixt. We were all back at it two weeks later and replaying the same mission. And I got to say, it felt interesting and different due to the exploration system and the randomization. Replaying that mission was actually quite fun. Now, I only played the first session, and it was marred by rule confusion. Mm. But I still walked away feeling positive about the game, if not the rule books. Yeah. I was interested. I wanted to play it right. I wanted to play it more. I just wanted to be more clear about certain aspects. So this is a dungeon crawler that does some things right and better than others out on the market. The AI in this game is much simpler when compared to similar other complex dungeon crawlers. And I love the targeting system and the way monster attack cards make each individual monster in a group unique. Like you're fighting a set of wolves, but one has matted fur and another has has bad breath. And the last has a focused stare and that changes how they all play. That's really cool. And unlike other games, we've never once argued over the way a monster would move or what it would do. Which for anyone who's played through the Gloomhaven campaign, you know, <laughs> there's the fact you can go online and run the AI through a machine to see if you got it right. Heck, even at this point, I grew to love the facing system. And I'm like, what board game has a facing system for combat? But you know what? The joy of getting an additional or stepped up damage die when hitting someone from behind makes it worth those additional rules. Now, that said, the combat system is highly random and can be quite frustrating. If, if this is, really is the meat of the game. And it features the one thing I honestly hate in adventure games going all the way to RPGs. And that's when you roll a hit and it gets turned into a miss. I don't like games where I roll a success only for that to turn into a failure due to the results of other dice. Now, thankfully, this isn't an opposed roll system because I hate it even more in those where I see my result before seeing the other. But this happens often in the Ghost Betwixt. Now, I'm not talking about hits being canceled by shields, right? Like, I'm used to that. I, play, I grew up playing Hero Quest. And, and the dodge system's fine too. But it's the fact that I get a awesome hit on and then roll a zero on my damage die and do nothing. I could roll five hits with the enemy rolling blanks on all their defense. It's a perfect roll for my character, and it means nothing if that damage die has a zero on it. 
Like, honestly, this is the one rule we have talked the most about house ruling that either you do a minimum one damage on a hit or that you can spend additional successes for damage. Whether it's like you have to spend two for one damage or you have to double what you needed to hit to do damage, but something. But raw, these rolls are just another whiff and they aren't fun. Now, as someone who plays a lot of XCOM, I guess I'm more used to whiffing and the struggles of randomization in combat. Uh, it's The painful part for me is the way it extends the length of the game, yes. not the fact that the whiffs are there. Now, I gotta admit, if we do auto damage, the bad guys would be doing auto damage to us. Maybe the game would be too too dangerous. I don't know. I don't know if there's a proper fix, but we've been thinking about it. So overall, the ghost betwixt for us. This isn't necessarily going to be for every group. Hopefully, if you've listened to this, you won't have the problems we had. And this has been a roller coaster. But a lot of that had to do with the fact we didn't know what we were in for. And a lot of that, honestly, is the game's fault and the designer's fault and the rule book's fault. Both the marketing for it and the way they hold back information on certain rules so as to keep them as surprises for later sets those wrong expectations. Really, the key with this game for anyone thinking of picking it up is knowing what you're in for. And that's why we're here right now. With the Ghost Betwixt, you are signing up for a long campaign game, a game that's going to take at least nine sessions and I'd, I'd be really surprised if someone won every mission the first time they played it. You're probably going to want to do more. Plus, there's the whole fact that you can grind the um, scavenger hunt missions. You may want to do that. That might be necessary to win the finer fights. We haven't gotten that far. Be well aware that those additional sessions are also going to be double the playtime of two hours listed on the box. Like, I don't know if the designer and their friends can hammer through this thing super quick, but for us... Like, we are not slow AP-prone players. This is a meaty, involved dungeon crawler, but a good one. It's a game that had quite the learning curve, but that was worth fighting through to get to the end. Yes, it's involved a lot of Googling and checking board game geeks to get the rules down, but once we had them, they actually all work really well once you know what they are. This is an involved game with a lot of customization for your characters, and honestly, I would call it unprecedented replayability as far as dungeon crawlers go. Like, without being a complete roguelike where everything's random, replaying a mission in this, it will be different from the last time you played. Not just by swapping in and out characters, but by the actual physical layout of the map and what shows up when. Of all the dungeon crawlers I played, this is the one I'm honestly most likely to be willing to play through a second time. Either playing different family members or playing with different players. But also be aware that the Board Game Geek forums will be your friend yes. unless a second printing comes out or new rule books are added into the proposed chapter two for this game that is expected. Know that making sure you're playing right is not as easy as it should be. If you dig meaty campaign games that are going to challenge your group and take a long time to finish, you're going to want to check out the Ghost Twix. Just realize what you're signing up for right from the start. And if you're the type of group who is happy to house rule things right away when it's not super clear, as opposed to the type who must play by the correct <laughs> rules, you might not even mind the rulebook issues. Now, I'll admit, when I'm reviewing a game, I want to play it by the raw, but I'll admit I'm just a raw gamer all the time. And I always want to know if I'm, if I'm house ruling it, I want to at least know what the intended rules were first. Now, if you're looking for a light, fun dungeon crawler, something like a hero quest set in modern times, stay away. This is not the game for you and your group. The Ghost Betwix is not a light game, has quite the learning curve, and is not easy. This is a game for experienced gamers who want a deep, tactical dungeon romp. Now, if you're looking for a silly, cartoony, horror-themed game, perhaps for a Halloween game night, Ghost Betwix is also not a good choice. Despite what it might look like based on the cover and the artwork, this is in no way a kid's game. And unless you've already unlocked the scavenger hunts, it doesn't even work as a one-shot themed game night experience. Nothing about this game is Saturday morning cartoonish. Well, that's it for our review of The Ghosts Betwix. If this seems like a game your group would enjoy, you still have time to order it now so you can start your game Halloween night. 
Now, in addition to this review, I also plan on writing up a written review of the Ghost Betwixt, which you'll be able to find at tabletopbellhop.com once it's live. There, I plan in to get into a bit more detail about the game and how the various phases actually play and the actions you can take. And I'll also give you a better idea on if this game will be perfect for your group or if it's something you should stay away from. And now, the Bellhop Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since the last episode. It's been a while. It's been three weeks. Uh, but most of that, honestly, for me, has been spent uh, recovering. Um, but we did get in some gameplays before my surgery and in the last week, starting with Smash Up Disney Edition. Uh, this is the first time I played any Smash Up game since the original game was released. Um, when it did come out, it was locally at least the new hotness. I had all the local gaming events at the local game stores, everyone was playing Smash. And honestly, me agreeing to review this one, thanks to the op, was me giving the entire system a second chance. And so far, I'm pretty glad I did. Now, I'm glad, guessing everyone listening knows Smash Up, but just in case, you're looking at an area majority card game where you're competing to control a number of base cards that are put out on the table. You're playing hero cards to those bases, trying to get them to a set total, which we call popping it. I don't know if that's the proper term, but since I first learned the game, we always called it popping a base, getting it to a set power total. And then the person are going to score points for based on how much power they each contributed to making it pop. Uh, the smash up part, of course, is that your deck of 40 cards is made by smashing two 20 card themed decks together. And in the case of this particular version, it's, of course, different Disney movies. So first off, I have to ask, is Smash Up better or is Smash Up Disney just more interesting? So what I will say is this is Smash Up. The, the, they're not different. They're not two different products. This is a Smash Up game. This is Smash Up as much as the first Smash Up box set, just as much as a Smash Up game with your friends that own all 200 different decks. I don't know how many actual Smash Up decks. There is nothing Disney about this game except for the theme of the decks and the artwork on the cards. This is not a Disney game. This is just Smash Up with Disney characters. Uh, like all Smash Up games, it is 100% fully compatible with every other Smash Up set out there. So yes, you could do Smash Up Mulan with, Mulan with zombies and you can Smash Up Aliens with Nightmare Before Christmas or Cthulhu with all of the above. Um, this is, do not think of this as a different game. This is Smash Up. Now, one of the things I do appreciate with this particular edition of Smash Up, note this is a starter set. That's important. You can just buy this box. It comes with the full rules for Smash Up. This is an entry point to Smash Up. So there is one little distinction. But the rules are the same you'll find in the original box set. Now, what I do like is that this particular rule set is obviously written with 20 years of experience. And it's very concise and it goes into almost like a CCG tournament level of detail when discussing things like timing and card interactions, which is just obviously based on 20 years of players asking questions about what happens when I do this in Smash Up. Now, the other thing they've added are mats for the bases would let you track what level they pop at and the total power level at the current spot, which honestly... I know some people hate these because part of Smash Up was the whole did the other players notice this is about the pop. But honestly, to me, that was the least fun aspect of the game. Being able to see what level every base is at a glance, I think, is awesome. So the rule book is kind of crazy. It's, yeah, it's long. It's dense. But if it gets the job done, then it's a step above many we may have talked about tonight. Yes, uh, it, it's intimidating, I will say. Um, and honestly, I still find Smash Up intimidating. Being an experienced gamer who likes heavy games, there is a lot of stuff going on when you play Smash Up. The biggest problem with Smash Up, and again, Smash Up, Smash Up Disney, they're interchangeable as far as I'm concerned, is the amount of stuff happening at once. Every base has an ability on it. Some of them happen when you play there. Some of them are always in play. Some of them let you move things from other bases to them, like just keeping track of if you're playing four players, there's five bases. Number of players plus one base is in play. Just keeping track of what each base that's currently in play does is a lot to take in. Then you've got 40 cards in your deck. And now I will admit some cards you have three different, like you'll have multiples of some cards. I don't know how many unique cards are in each deck. Let's say they're, the, 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 I don't know, whatever. Even if it's only 10 cards, 
you have 10 cards to learn from one deck plus 10 cards from another deck and how those two interact together. You're trying to figure that out. Then every other player has another set of 20 cards that really, if you're going to play well, you should know about and you should understand. And even if you don't, if you're playing totally blind, which we play totally blind, you have to at least remember what all the cards that are already out on the table are doing. So like, yeah, it's not, it's one thing to know that, that I'm, I'm going to totally make this off at the top of my head. This nightmare before Christmas card that every other time someone else plays a card there gets a token. Having to remember that is bad enough. And honestly, group of experienced gamers is me, Deanna, Tori, and Kat who have played hundreds of board games, if not thousands, couldn't keep track of everything that was going on. And it was constantly a, okay, I played this here. Does anything else trigger? Do you have anything that triggers? Was there, oh, wait, do you remember that one card that's over there that says when your thing goes up, you move it to the locate? Like, I, there was just so much to keep track of for any of us. But even in that one play, I'm like, okay, this is a game where you need to get to know the cards. If you really want to enjoy this, you got to get to know the cards. This is a game where I think is going to get just better and better the more you play. And whether that's, that's especially if you play with the same decks, like I, I do, this did not make me go, I'm going to go buy a bunch of smash up expansions and throw them in. I want to play this one a bunch more times so I can just get to know the, um, how many decks are there? Eight decks. I think it is eight decks in this game. And honestly, I, it's not really a bad thing, right? Like that, that's what you do with competitive card games. Like, isn't that kind of the whole thing? Yeah, I mean, ideally, the cards need to have enough detail that you can play slowly as it may be without prior knowledge. But yes, the gameplay should always improve with familiarity. These are games, uh, as much as anything else, there are lifestyle games where you are always learning, you know, and that some person's going to show up with a, a new smash up that you've never played before. And you're going to have to learn how those cards interact yep. with everything else. No, exactly. And it is much more than just what you smash because of the way cards from other players interact with yours. Like there are cards that are like for every minion in play and you're like, Oh, okay. And your deck generates minions. Does it interesting? Now, as for being a good Disney game, um, well, this goes back to our ghost betwixt review. Don't be fooled by the Disney name and the cover. And this is not my first smash up or smash up light. This is a full smash up set with all the full rules for smash up. It's just as complex and involved to play as any previous one. Not that smash up's not seriously complex. It's not like one of the heaviest games out there, but it's very much not a little kid's game. Yet another Disney property not aimed at kids, which yeah. to be fair, seems to be their go-to of late as they've announced their upcoming card game won't be for the younger crowd either. So they are still putting out lots of kids games as well. Just look at Funko's latest lineup. They're still doing games based on all the rides, right? So if you were looking at kids games, they're out there. You've got the It's a Small World. The, the Great Thunder Railroad actually looks really neat with like a 3D board. Um, there's the Haunted Mansion. Those are all actually aimed at younger kids. So they're doing both, which honestly I think makes sense. All right, next up. Enough about Smash Up for now. I only played once. More, more to come. Next, we played two different games of Mountains Out of Molehills, um, both with the kids and Mim, as well as playing with Tori and Cat. And the big thing is that it worked. Um, this game played so much better with more than two players. All of the problems we found playing two player, which you can hear about in our last episode, were gone. Once you had more movement cards to choose from, it wasn't a problem. Now, my kids in particular loved the game. They've already asked to play it again a couple times. Uh, Tori and Cat also enjoyed it. Though I will admit they didn't, they did turn down, hey, let's play again. They're like, nah, that's good. We're going to head home. But they're totally up for playing a second game another time. They're like, hey, no, I'll, I'll happily play this next week, but I don't feel like playing a second time in a row, which honestly, that's not really that bad. At this point, this one's getting a thumbs up um, as long as you play with four players. Now, what I haven't tried yet is playing with three. So my goal, uh, one of my goals for the next week is to play Mountains of the Molehills three player. And then hopefully we'll be ready to review Mountains Out of Molehills from the op next Wednesday. Well, it's great to know that it seems like it's just a player count issue and not a game issue. Yeah. There's all too many player uh, games out there where the player counts are just, you know, overly stretched because it yes. helps improve sales. Um, but it's not a broken game otherwise. 
Now, one thing that's interesting is um, I published our unboxing this week and I was watching it. And I was like, why the heck are there so many cards? Well, with four players, every card's in every game. That's why. It is just enough cards to put out five cards per player for a full six rounds. So now I know why that stack's so big. Now, speaking of games with Tori and Kat, we did replay mission four of the Ghost Be Twixt and won this time. And now unlocked all the things. At least that's what it feels like. Um, now, a couple notes on that. First being that replaying the mission was interesting. Uh, it was interesting to see how it changed up. We ended up with like totally different um, random rooms. Like it not only has random rooms, but in this one, you actually randomize the monster tokens. So every time you play, you might get different sets of monsters. So that was a nice thing we hadn't seen before. And I got to say, I think we got a little easier monster set. Um, well, we did win. The whiff factor was bad. Um, the game again took over four hours, I, which is why I called this out as a problem. Like it's now gotten to, I don't know who you saw on board game geek that said the game speeds up. Maybe the scavenger hunts are quick. I don't know. Yeah, it is an unexpected slog. Now the real bad news is that we unlocked all the things, or at least I, I think we did. I did actually cheat and read ahead before the review to see if there's anything else. Uh, we now know what monster trophies are, and it ends up we tracked them completely wrong and screwed ourselves out of rewards, which really sucks, because, like, why not just explain how they work the first time? Or at least tell you how to record the information accurately. Um, it's actually really neat. And and that chart in the back of the book, we shouldn't even been looking at. Remember the one you looked at? Yeah, had yeah, not, well, it has something to do with them, but the, the system works completely different. You literally trade in sets of them. So like one set would unlock by trading in monster trophy three, three, two, and six. And then you go to that thing and you're supposed to not know what's in them when you're unlocking. And then you go to that back page to find out what cards get added. Now, the interesting thing is none of the cards, you don't get them. They just get added into all the decks, mm. which is actually kind of cool. So it just increases the stuff you'll find later. It's a neat system. I just wish they'd flip and explained it at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, we unlocked the trader. So now we can not only buy and sell items, uh, which now clarifies that you can't sell from vending machines by exclusion, which is an annoying way to learn something. Um, so that was something else I wanted to make sure to call out in the review. You can't sell the vending machines. And we unlocked the side missions, but it ends up they're not side missions. Um, I totally thought they were, or they're, they're clearly stated to be replayable and they use a different format from the rest. And I thought they were optional though, and they're not. So we are at a point where we can't play mission five until we complete three different scavenger hunts. So you're looking at a minimum of nine sessions, which honestly is kind of good because more gameplay is good. But for a game I was trying to review by Halloween, it would have been really nice when I told the designer we're having a hard time fitting this up. He's like, oh, it's good. You got to Halloween. Could have said, you, you do realize there's 10. You're going you're gonna to need at least 10 plays. Would have been nice to know. Yeah, that that's a big ouch. Uh, um, and I, I mean, to be fair, for the on the designers part, I doubt there are too many reviewers who have tried to play the entire game before review. Before review, well, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, the biggest problem, of course, was that I wanted to finish the game before we publish a review. That didn't happen. Um, honestly, at this rate, we're not going to finish this until twenty twenty three. At this rate, I'm guessing, like we're looking at seven more games, like. That's not going to happen anytime soon. Seven? No, five more games. Minimum five more games. Um, so we made the call to do, or I made the call to do the review tonight. Um, now, again, what I did was peek ahead. It didn't look like there were any other big surprises or anything to unlock. Yeah, there's some stuff. And while my plan is if we do finish the campaign, no if, I'll do a follow-up review. We'll, we'll share any new thoughts I have now that it's finished. Um, but again, I say if, because I'm certain tori in particular um wants a break from ghost Twix and you know play some other stuff well you can always try and solo it to get to the end yeah but that'd be a spoiler for everyone else they don't want me playing their characters like i i, I could if tori and cat refuse they're like no we're done we don't want to play that ever again <laughs> that that might be what i do at this might, point i might just leave it where it is maybe it's something we'll pick up again at some point or i'll play a new campaign with different players at some point Maybe with my kids once they're a little older. We'll see. I, I don't know where that game's going at this point. It, it feels like a weight off my shoulders getting that review done, honestly. Um, now, the other game we got to play with Tori and Cat was that I introduced them 
to the fantastic Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. Uh, this is the Cowboy Bebop official licensed deck builder from Japanime Games. Thank you for sending that, Japanime. And I'm happy to say it was a big hit. Now, this is important. The reason this is important is that Tori and Kat, despite being of the appropriate age and being semi-weebs who like a lot of anime, had no idea what Cowboy Bebop was other than knowing the name as a famous anime. They didn't even know it was uh, a Space Bounty Hunter show. They had no clue what it was about. Now, thankfully, that theme is pretty universal. Look, you're a bunch of bounty hunters. You're on a ship. You're going to planets and you're working together, but you don't really like each other and you want to be the person who bags the money, right? That makes sense. And they picked it up really quickly. They got the mix of cooperation and competitiveness that's core to this game. And I got to say, I really enjoyed it. They enjoyed it. Like to the, the they're thinking of buying a copy and we'll probably go watch the show now because of it. Um, I love playing it for a second time because it's again, as we were just talking about with with um, Smash Up, the biggest thing about card games is getting to know the cards and the interactions and combos and stuff like that. And I'm starting to see more of the, the cards and what I might want to do and the way they work together. Um, the people we played with did some really cool things to maximize their points, making sure that like, yeah, I could take out this guy. But if I do this first, I can actually investigate him twice without going to beat him in any way by investigating before I punch him to get more of those tokens. And I was like, oh, man, that's I was all about beat him as quick as possible when I played the first time. So I was really cool to see. The part I'm baffled by, why is no one else talking about this game? This game's fantastic. Yeah, especially given the popularity of Cowboy Bebop. Something seems to have just gone wrong with the marketing on this, I guess. I yeah. I still think it was planned to be a Kickstarter. And there are Kickstarter stretch goals in my box. The fact it gave me cardboard standees and miniatures makes me think that they like I I I can't applaud companies for doing this, but I think there were stretch goals that were going to end up in the game no matter what that never just they end up giving you everything. And just that box insert too is just like one of the tightest best fitting box inserts I've ever seen. The production quality on this is huge for a non Kickstarter game. And I'm wondering if they're regretting not kickstarting it just for the buzz. Like there's I honestly no one talking about it. Maybe it's out there. I'm not I'm trying not to shoot down any other content creators that have talked about this, but it hasn't crossed by my feed. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, my final game to talk about tonight is this one, Pocketbook Adventures, though I don't really have much to say that I didn't say in the review, except, man, it's good. Um, I, I don't really like solo games. I'm usually the person who's like, if I'm going to play a solo game, I'll play something on my phone or I'll go boot up the PlayStation or something. But I'm really digging this. Like, like the, the, the itch it's scratching for me is back in the day, Deanna and I would like decide to go to London, right? And we'd be sitting, we'd go get breakfast. And while we're at breakfast, we would stop at a newsstand and we would pick up a copy of Games Magazine. Oh, I miss Games Magazine. <laughs> and then we would get on a train and go to London and we would sit and play the puzzles in Games Magazine. Somehow this is scratching that itch, that, that sit down and play a paper puzzle with a pencil. There's something ephemeral about that that I'm really enjoying. There's just something about that I love. And no, I don't have a perfect store. I have not scored. I, the first few, I have not scored uh, nine stars on each mission so far. So, All right, well, uh, what do you have uh, planned for the coming weeks? What's, what's coming up? Okay, so everyone watching right now live on Twitch, please stick around for the after show if you want a sneak peek at what we're going to be reviewing in the future. I have not one, not two, but three boxes from publishers sitting next to me here that I'm going to be opening up. So this will be your, your sneak peek to what we are going to be talking about coming soon. Now, along with that, I already have stuff that hasn't opened yet um, behind me. Um, there's the B-movie expansion for Roll Camera and the Disney Sorcerer's Arena game with its first expansion I haven't unboxed yet. So we've got those to unbox. And as already mentioned, I am really looking to get in some three-player games of Mountains Out of Molehills and have a review ready for next week. Maybe in the meantime, we'll get in some more Disney Smash Up plays before then as well. Um, but I will say I'm not playing the Ghost Betwixt this week. <laughs> 
Well, now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Join this list by going to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop because uh, D likes to point out we don't call it out quite enough. First, we have the Misdirected Mark podcast, a podcast that I really need to catch up on. I just listened to an episode from April 2021 yesterday. So as far as I know, they're still going. I need to catch up badly, as well as many other podcasts. Well, Dukas, thank you. Evil John. Thank you, John. Donna, always great to see you in the chat when you can be here, even if you had to miss tonight. Yeah, I think this is like the first time Donna hasn't been in the chat. I cursed it because I put this in the show notes. Uh, finally, Valentine Pache. Thank you, Valentine or Valentine. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means our shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. And, of course, don't forget to tip your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and you're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.